I'm calling this meeting of Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's here in the audience tonight and also those that will be viewing the uh, meeting on G10 television. Uh, we have a full house. We're going to begin the meeting tonight uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance left by, led by uh, Council Member Randy Thomas, followed by the invocation by Mr. John Carter. Please rise. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we pause again to give you thanks, to give you thanks for this most beautiful day and all the blessings and benefits you bestow upon us individually and as the city of Jacksonville. We pray for our nation. We pray for all those who sit in positions of authority. We pray that they will be led to wise decisions so that they may serve the common good. We give thanks for all of our city employees, especially those who will be promoted and recognized this evening and that one who will be the service she's given and will be retiring this evening. It is through the efforts of each of us that we can best serve our city and its citizens. We pray for our military personnel who are serving us here and around the world, for their families, and for their safety. And as always, we remember our mayor and our council, that your guidance and direction would be with them. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Should have a received a copy of the uh, agenda for tonight's meeting. I'd entertain a motion at this time to adopt. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We got some presentations to make tonight. I'm going to come around front here. <clears throat> I'd like to make tonight, I'd like to ask some members of the uh, Tau Omega, Omega chapter of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Society to please join me up front. Led by Ms. Margaret Brown. Tau Omega Omega Chapter Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated requested a proclamation tonight um, in honor in naming of the uh, Jacksonville Bypass segment there of the Coretta Scott King and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, freeway there. And I'm going to read a proclamation that we've prepared for this event. I'm glad, glad y'all came up. <laughs> like good support. Whereas the ideals, ideals of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King have been of great benefit to people throughout the world, and they were and are recognized as outspoken champions of justice and human dignity. And whereas their commitment to human rights serve as a reminder that improving the quality of life for all people is a responsibility of every member of society. And whereas Dr. and Mrs. King made significant contributions during their lifetimes towards advancing the cause of civil rights both in the United States and abroad. And whereas Coretta Scott King was a strong advocate for women's rights and considered women's issues to be an important part of the continuing battle for civil rights for all. And whereas on the fifth day of July 2006, the Jacksonville City Council adopted Resolution 2006-35 endorsing the naming of the segment of Jacksonville Bypass from Highway 224 to, <coughs> on Lejeune Boulevard to its intersection with Highway 17 North Marine Boulevard in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. And whereas in early 2007, the North Carolina Department of Transportation approved the naming 
of this segment of the Jacksonville Bypass, uh, the Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King Jr. Highway. Now therefore, I, Sammy Phillips, the mayor of the city of Jacksonville, do hereby proudly proclaim March 21st, 2017 as a day of recognition as the 10th anniversary of the naming of a segment of the Jacksonville Bypass in honor of Coretta Scott King and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I encourage all citizens to join me in honoring this extraordinary legacy of Dr. and Mrs. King. And I'm gonna present that to the <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, I am Kimberly Winston and I am the president of the local chapter of the Ta Omega Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated was founded on January 15, 1908 on the campus of Howard University. We are the first African American sorority. Our legacies um, involve scholarship, service, and sisterhood. We were founded on service to all mankind. Our local chapter has been in existence in Onslow County for the past 23 years, and we continue that legacy of providing service and scholarship to the um, Onslow County community. Um, this is very special to us, the proclamation, because Coretta Scott King was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. On behalf of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, we also like to thank Mr. Blunt's daughter. He was instrumental in getting this bypass highway named um, Coretta Scott King and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Once again, we're very active in the community, providing services to clients, um, customers, um, doing um, health fairs, um, educational fairs. We give back to the community through scholarships each year. So we are very appreciative of the mayor and the city council for this award. Thank you very much. The next presentation I'd like to make tonight, I would like to ask Chief Mike Yanira, uh, the Director of Public Safety, to join me up front. Also, um, I would like to ask Captain Patricia Driggers and her father, Mr. Samuel Eugene Driggers Sr., to join me up front. Patricia Driggers was born in Oxnard, California. Her father's Marine Corps career brought the family to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I'm sorry, Lejeune. Sorry, George. Uh, where she attended school, graduating from Jacksonville High School in 1985. After an internship with JPD while still a student, she developed an interest in law enforcement that would be begin her career path of over 28 years. All served with the Jacksonville Police Department. 
She began as a police trainee in March of 1989, completing basic law enforcement training at Coastal Carolina Community College in May of 1989. She steadily rose through the ranks from police officer one in 1990 to police officer two in 91, sergeant in 96, commander in 2000, and to her current rank of captain in 2001. She holds a master's degree in justice administration from Methodist University, a bachelor's in management and organizational development from Mount Olive University, and an associate's in criminal justice from uh, Coastal Carolina Community College. Captain Driggers is also a graduate of the Administrative Office Management Program at North Carolina State University and holds the Advanced Law Enforcement Certification from the North Carolina Training and Standards Division. Captain Driggers has served in a wide variety of positions as a supervisor and a member of the command staff. These include Administrative Services Captain, field operations captain, community services, and patrol. Captain Patricia Driggers' long tenure at the Jacksonville Police Department has resulted in 28 years of positive law enforcement contacts, interactions, and partnerships in our community. And until she was standing here, I didn't believe she was going to retire. <laughs> and uh, at this time, I would like to present you with your service weapon. Thank you. Mr. Driggers, yes, sir. I would like to present you with your daughter's badge, oh, Captain. Thank you. Thank you for I bet you didn't realize they were that heavy, did you? It's been a wonderful career. There's a lot of people in this room that I owe a lot of time, dedication, and uh, faith to. So I want to say thank you to everybody, but especially to my father. As a matter of fact, uh, 17 years ago this week, he pinned my captain's badge on me. So it's a full circle. He has been uh, my biggest supporter in this career. And there's a lot of people in this room that I thank very much for being there with me uh, during this time. So thank you.
Anyone else for photos? Okay, thank you. Our next presentation, I would like to ask battalion, uh, our newest battalion chief, Mr. Edward T. Tallman, to join me up front. Aaron, you might as well come on too. Okay, do pictures. We'll do pictures when we're done. The current promotional succession at the uh, Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services created vacancies at the rank of battalion chief and captain. Applications were received and reviewed and the candidates participated in a process consisting of formal presentation and a series of oral, oral interviews. Edward, everyone knows as T. Tallman, was selected for promotion to the rank of battalion chief. T. Tallman was born and raised in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and has been with the fire, uh, Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services for 17 years. He has been married to his wife, Erin, for the last 13 years and has a 10-year-old little girl named Lily. <clears throat> T. graduated from Jacksonville High School in 1995 and obtained his associate's degree from Coastal Carolina Community College in 2011 in the fire protection technology, and his bachelor's degree in fire and emergency services administration from Federal State University in 2014. T is proud to be a third generation firefighter with the city and holds state certifications in firefighter one and two, fire inspector, fire instructor, emergency medical technician basic, technical rescue general, vehicle and machinery rescue, and service water rescue and ropes. He attended several other leadership courses and is a member of the department's water rescue team. He has received the department's life-saving award, extrication award, and officer of the year award. He has served as a firefighter, a driver, captain, and training captain before his upcoming promotion to battalion chief. And we're next gonna administer the oath and uh, if you'll repeat after me. I, and state your name. I, Edward Tolman. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will be vigilant and alert. That I will be vigilant and alert. In performing my duties. In performing my duties. As a battalion chief. As a battalion chief. Of the city of Jacksonville. Of the city of Jacksonville. Fire and emergency services. Fire and emergency services. That I will not be influenced in any matter. That I will not be influenced in any matter. On account of personal bias or prejudice. On account of personal bias or prejudice. And that I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain. The Constitution and laws of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. The Constitution and laws of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge. And impartially. And impartially. Execute the duties of my office. To execute the duties of my office. As a battalion chief. As a battalion chief. Of the City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. The City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. According to the best of my skills, knowledge, and abilities, and judgment. According to the best of my skills, knowledge, ability, and judgment. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Chief. Thanks,
far so good. Very good. That's perfect. Well, I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of, of this, this young man. Don't you go anywhere yet. We've got to get some more pictures. I, I know your grandmother, Miss Evelyn, sitting out there, and uh, your, your mom and dad and your, your uh, in-law, uh, father-in-law, and your brother, and his daughter, and we've got a lot of people out there. Why don't you all come up and get some pictures with him? personnel would like to come forward and have a picture taken, come on up. John never could count to three. Okay, anybody else for pictures? All right. Next, we're going to swear in a new captain, Nicholas Strong. That's Nicholas and his wife. <laughs> Quickly, we're going to read a little bit about him first. And uh, Nick enrolled in a high school uh, program that allowed him to, com to complete a student insurance internship with the Jacksonville Fire Department. From that day, Nick knew that fire department was where he wanted to begin his career. 
He graduated from Richlands High School in 2006, and Nick obtained the Firefighter 1 and 2 and Emergency Medical Technician B certification in 2007, and was hired by the City of Jacksonville's Fire Emergency Services in 2008. He and his wife, Samantha, have been married for five years. <clears throat> Nicholas holds the certifications as Firefighter 1 and 2, Driver Operator of Pumps, Driver Operator Aerials, Emergency Vehicle Driver, Fire Officer 2, Fire Instructor 2, Technical Rescue, Vehicle Machinery Rescue, uh, Hazmat Technician, North Carolina Rapid Intervention Team Training, Incident Safety Officer, and is part of the department's hazmat team. Nick graduated from Coastal Carolina Community College with an associate's degree in fire protection technology and is currently working on a bachelor's degree in fire and emergency services administration at Fayetteville State University. Nick graduated from North Carolina State Breathing Equipment Firefighter Survival School in January of 2017. He also works part-time with the Onslow County Emergency Responders and is an assistant instructor at the Coastal Fire Academy. Nick has moved through the ranks in the department uh, from firefighter trainee all the way up to where he is now. Uh, and he was selected for promotion to captain. Uh, I'm sure that was following a extensive uh, testing and, and interviews. So what we're going to do is we're going to administer the oath to you. And if you'll repeat after me, I state your name. I, Nicholas Strong. Do solemnly swear. That I will be alert and vigilant. That I will be alert and vigilant. In performing my duties. In performing my duties. As a captain. As a captain. Of the City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. Close enough. <laughs> <coughs> that I will not be influenced in any matter. Uh, that I will not be influenced in any matter. On account of personal bias or prejudice. On account of personal bias or prejudice. That I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain. The Constitution and Laws of the United States. The Constitution and Laws of the United States. And the Constitution and Laws of North Carolina. The Constitution and Laws of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and execute. Discharge and execute. The duties of my office as a captain. The duties of my office as a captain. Of the City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. Of the City of Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services. According to the best of my skill. Abilities, abilities and judgment. Abilities and judgment. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Captain. Let's get this thing started. <laughs> Come up and get a picture Please taken. Come
Okay, squeeze a little bit together. Now, if we can have a uh, chief artisan, who's going to be the tagging chief with me? Okay. Okay. If the two of you come up, we'll get a picture with you. <coughs> Thank you. Not at all. We'll drive you, drive you off in the car. Mike, please step in. One more uh, unannounced uh, thing to do. The presentation. I'd like to ask uh, Councilwoman Angela Washington if you would join me up front. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hello. <laughs> I am uh, very, very honored to be able to present you with this uh, achievement uh, 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 leadership excellence here from the National League of Cities. It recognizes the dedication and commitment of Angela Washington, Councilwoman with the City of Jacksonville, North Carolina, for the successful completion of the Bronze Certifi Certificate Leadership Fellow and the Certificate of Achievement in Leadership Program for the National League of Cities. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, we have come to a point in the meeting, uh, I think before I do that, I'm going uh, to ask for a, a session of public comment. We're going to go ahead and do that first. Uh, we don't have a sheet. We don't have a sign-up sheet tonight. I assume nobody signed up. Uh, is there anyone that may have decided uh, at some point they want to speak tonight? Okay, so we're, we're going to go to... Uh, the plan here was to let some of you folks that are here for the presentations to go ahead and make a uh, your exit at this point if you if you want to. Hey, you're welcome to stay now if you want to. <laughs> hey, good scene. How you doing, fella? What's up? How good? How are you? Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, Council, uh, next on the agenda here is the adoption of minutes and consent items. We have three sets of minutes uh, to adopt. Move approval. Second. So I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Minutes and, and consent items have been approved. Um, first item. It is old business here, number five, and this is a continuation of uh, this particular item, uh, and Jeremy Smith is going to uh, present yeah, this. Council, as you may recall, at your last meeting, we you held and considered this request for rezoning for Holiday City Manufacturer Home Community at 553 Corbin Street. After the public hearing was closed, the council had to some discussion and tabled this item so staff could work with the applicant on refining their proposed terms and conditions, which go along with the request of a rezoning to plan development residential. Since that time, staff has worked with the applicant, and I would like to point out the changes that were proposed. Um, one of the items of contention were the age of new homes that could move into the park. Uh, this, the applicant has proposed that no homes older than 15 years be moved into the park unless the city building inspections uh, conducts a full inspection and determines that in its sole discretion that that model is up to quality to provide a quality living environment. And in that case, any model could not exceed 20 years in age and that current homes located in Holiday City um, are grandfathered and can be re relocated within them, and that any new homes moved into Holiday City shall meet the HUD standards that were effective the year it was manufactured. I'd also like to point out some additions of benefits that were identified that there were four that the city will be able to assist Holiday City in providing quality and affordable housing by limiting the age of the homes that can be moved in into the park uh, at no more than 15 years old, that Holiday City will open its pool for two weeks during the summer for two hours each morning for swimming classes sponsored by the city, that Holiday City, along with working with the city, will conduct a study for a public-private partnership to open the pool to the public full-time, and that the city and Holiday City are will partner to mitigate significant inflow and infiltration to greatly reduce the amount of infl inflow and infiltration that is entering the sewer system surrounding Holiday City mobile home community. Um, with that, the staff is still recommending approval of the rezoning with these terms and conditions. Uh, Mr. Mike Douglas representing Holiday City is here as well as staff to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, like I said, it's a continuation from the uh, February 21st meeting. Uh, there is a public hearing, and we're going to, we recessed it. We're going to reconvene at this time, and I'll ask anyone who wants to come forward and speak to do so at this time. Seeing no one, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the public hearing. Counselor, you're being asked to consider the proposed zone rezoning. With those conditions. First, I think you know the the public hearing was recessed, so even Jeremy's uh, should be included in the public hearing. And it, uh, I think it's good to uh, again uh, 
get the uh, applicant, Mr. Douglas, on behalf of Mobile Home Park to come forward and to oh, agree to the conditions that have been uh, proposed by Jeremy. Hey, uh, Carl, <coughs> strike that close in the public hearing then. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, in essence, if I understand you're just saying that you want me to agree to mm -hmm. what Jeremy just described, and we are in complete agreement with okay. that. I uh, actually look forward to the opportunity to continue working with the city and uh, developing the partnership uh, that I re referenced the last time and what we've talked about, what um, uh, the city manager and I have talked about. Would you also state your name for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. Mike Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Is there anyone else wishes to speak to this matter while we've got it, the hearing re reopened? All right now, not seeing anyone, I'm closing the public hearing. And, uh, Councilor, you're being asked to consider the rezoning request. Mr. Phillips, I'll make the uh, motion to recommend that the <clears throat> City Council approve the rezoning and request based on the findings of facts A through J found in the affirmative and find that the rezoning advances the public interest by allowing for more orderly and logical development. I have a motion and second. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> that brings us to agenda item number six this evening. annexation process for city-owned property that is contiguous to the city limits. The property totals 3.12 acres and is located in the city's extraterritorial jurisdiction on the north side of Ramsey Road near the Carolina Forest Development. This site was obtained by the city in January of 2012 and then is the location of a city well site. <coughs> the there is no financial impact associated with this annexation as the property is owned by the city and, as I mentioned, contains a well site. Staff recommends the council adopt the annexation ordinance as presented. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Anyone present wishes to speak to this matter? One, so I'm going to close the public here to reconvene the uh, regular meeting. And, Councilor, you're being asked to consider the annexation ordinance. Mayor Phillips, I move that we adopt the annexation ordinance as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? Just a question. What is what is that city-owned property? Is that is that the uh, that area that uh, would extend all the way back to Henderson Drive? Is that... to the city a, a while back. All right. it, 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 and the only reason why I asked that is because it wasn't shown on the, the city proper, on, the, on the, the, the blue should have been city, right? Or not? Yeah. The, the, that's, the, Actually, you bring up a point we'll have to research. Sure. I don't know that we've ever annexed that 227 acres into the city. Yeah. We, have we? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. It, it should show it. It's blue. On the other map. It's the right one. Oh, it's the right away. Oh. Yeah, the area is not shown up as corporate limits because that was an area reserved by the Carolina Forest Development Company for a possible extension of Henderson Drive, and it's never been annexed into the area because it's never been developed for roadway purposes. So that's why it doesn't show up on the map as uh, city limits. This area right here? Well, no. yeah, he's talking he's about, about on the, the city-owned property, right? Well, the city-owned property. That should be. No, um, blue. Should. I mean, but this one shows blue. The other one did not. We'll verify that, sir. 
Okay. Any other discussion? Here, none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Brings us to agenda item number seven for this evening. This is a public hearing on the Unified Development Ordinance text amendment for wireless telecommunication facilities or complexes. And uh, Ryan King, our permitting administrator, will be presenting this item. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, tonight I'm going to go over some of the information that I shared with Council at your workshop on March 7th and uh, just highlight some things where we've been and kind of where we think we're going. And then we'll dive into the the proposed text changes that we referenced at the workshop on the 7th. So we'll start with some tower examples. These are examples of towers that we have typically seen in the past, the guy wired example, the self-support structures, and the monopole, which we have all of these types here in Jackson. These are what people, when you hear cell phone tower, this is kind of what we think when we mention the term wireless communication facilities. Uh, because of the new demand and technology changes going to 5G, the emergence of Internet of Things, the amount of antennas and wireless communication facilities that are going to be needed is going to increase significantly based on what the industry is stating. Uh, currently, the city has granted franchise agreements with four carriers. Those are the four carriers that uh, will need towers approximately every uh, 100 yards, or I'm sorry, every 500 yards each, so one five towers, four or five towers for 500 yards. Uh, within the city of Jacksonville, we've already issued about 30 of these locations. Uh, there's an example here, which is right across from the hospital. As you can see, the, the infrastructure is new, and there was existing infrastructure that the antenna could have been mounted on potentially, but in lieu of doing that, because there was no ordinance to require that, they installed a new facility. And that's part of the reason why we're asking for changes to the code because we would like to see them utilize the existing infrastructure when at all possible versus adding new just because it's more convenient to do so. Some other examples of Jacksonville. Uh, the example on the left is in front of Fire Station 2. So re recently constructed Fire Station 2. They went in there and, and added a new pole and it's substantially larger than the others to put an antenna on top. The other example is next to the Jacksonville Mall uh, beside the Belks. Uh, here's a residential example that I wanted to share. I didn't share this with you on the 7th. This is in Northwoods. So it's not just the commercial areas. So as you can imagine, when, when the folks here at, at these two houses, when they get up in the morning to walk outside and get the paper, they get to see the brown electrical box that's in their front yard, even though it's technically in the right-of-way, it's still viewed as, well, that's my front yard. And they've got a new pole that sits next to the old pole, so there's side-by-side -side poles. Instead of that pole being removed, they just added a new one right beside it so that they could put a taller antenna at this location. So this is an example of Jacksonville in a residential zone, and we have several of these in Jacksonville. And we, we envision more. Uh, here is a more recent trend that we're seeing the possibility of tower request literally right next to the highway or the street that's a 120, 180 foot tall tower. So the city of Jacksonville, when, when this information was kind of um, shared amongst planners in the state, we started looking at what our options were. And we brought that before council back on the 7th, and we asked for and received direction to seek the expert assistance. And, and the folks that we've identified to do that would be the Carolina Telecommunication Services Company, and then create additional standards to protect the integrity, nature, character of the community. And that's what we're here tonight to discuss is the new ordinance language. So I'll cover the expert assistance part first which will also be covered in agenda item eight, which is an amendment to our fee schedule. We would treat this similar to the way that developers deal with transportation impact analysis. They'll be required to pay an upfront fee, which will basically be to cover the cost of our expert assistance reviewing those applications. And this is all in accordance with the North Carolina General Statutes. It's also in line with what other cities and towns are doing across North Carolina. They'll see as they will act as our liaison between the industry and those that have the, the background and the technical jargon. You know, they know what the language is and how to deal with that. They will serve on our behalf 
they will enable the city to make informed decisions. So they'll basically say, we've reviewed the application and here's your options. And city council and staff will be able to use that information to make decisions with some expert assistance that we haven't had in the past. Uh, one other key thing with this is the fact that if somebody brings in 50 applications, we've got a time limit that's set up where we've got to review those within 30 days. It doesn't matter whether one application comes in or if 100 applications comes in. So in the event that we have a large quantity, they will be able to provide the assistance that we need to review those applications in accordance with the statutes. Here are some examples of other communities here in North Carolina that are using uh, expert assistance and with Carolina Telecommunication Services. And Carolina Telecommunication Services also assisted the city in writing the language that we are asking you to incorporate within the UDO. So the first part would be to eliminate all of the existing language as it pertains to telecommunication facilities and replace it with the new language that city staff, management, and Carolina Telecommunication Services has been working on over the past few months. And to highlight those changes, uh, a minor adjustment to the use table would be to clarify the name of these type facilities. We will, as I mentioned, completely rewrite the use specific standards. We will create a specific definitions that are only relevant to the wireless telecommunication facilities. We want to make sure and will maintain the flight path overlay, the 100 foot uh, maximum height within the flight path overlay so that our military aircraft can, you know, find their approaches to the base safely. We've actually talked with base officials with the UDO amendment. We're going to create a lighting standard that the base has asked us to do on previous applications. We're going to go ahead and codify that. So when applicants are submitting their applications, they will see that that is a requirement before they ever make their application versus having to make a plan revision uh, once we get to um, staff review where we ask them to add a red light. They'll already know that that's expected. And that's for, for the base. Uh, anything over 100 feet, they want a red blinking light. So with new towers, they will be required to provide evidence that there are no other options to co-locate on existing towers, that the height they're proposing uh, is one that is needed, not just hey, we want it that tall so that, you know, we have a little bit better uh, range or, you know, it's, they're going to have to show that there's a reason to go that high. Uh, we're also going to promote the least visual intrusiveness. Some of these antennas can get a little busy and, and be very visible as you're driving up and down our major corridors. And we're also going to require that they use the largest search ring possible to make sure that they have they, a need versus other locations within that search ring that they could co-locate on a building, on an existing pole, water tower, electrical transmission line, those type things. New tower, we're gonna to switch back to the monopole. Uh, we changed that a few years ago where before we required monopole and then we re relaxed that standard. We wanna put that monopole back in and that's just so it's a cleaner look to go with that visual intrusiveness to, to eliminate that. There's also going to be a balloon test that would be required with these new uh, regulations. The neighborhood meeting we already have in the standards, so if we're worried that the neighborhood's going to come out uh, and be concerned, it gives us the opportunity or the mayor and council to require a neighborhood meeting similar to what we're going to do with the church in a nearby neighborhood. The lighting, as I mentioned. There's also going to be a provision for relief that, you know, it's, as I understand it, these ordinances are legally defendable because we have an opportunity to provide relief if they can show that there's truly a need and they need that relief. We're also going to create some specific standards for these new right-of-way poles. And we're going to limit the height to 35 feet. That's pretty much typical with what we see with existing utility poles so they don't go taller, like 180 feet. And, um, you know, we want cabinets that are consistent to the size or smaller of the DOT cabinets and we want to see green poles so that there's no ground contamination. Uh, the, the pole examples here in the slide, this is an example from the town of Wake Forest, which is just north of Raleigh. Uh, these are some new technology poles that have been installed. Uh, I think they refer to them as an e-pole. And 
as I mentioned, you know, if you've got existing infrastructure, if there's not quite enough room, you know, you could always remove the pole and install one back in its place that could accommodate the antenna versus just plopping one down next to it and saying, well, that's the easier way to go, even though it creates additional visual clutter. We also want to see concealed design and that they meet or exceed NESC standards for wind and ice. I'll be happy to answer any questions that mayor and council may have at this time and also have Rusty Monroe here tonight representing Carolina Telecommunication Services. Questions, Mr. Warden? Balloon test. What is it? Um, Rusty, do you want to explain the balloon test? It's not the one the police department gives. <laughs> Thank you, members of council, mayor. My name is Rusty Monroe. I'm with the Center for, excuse me, <clears throat> for Carolina Telecommunication Services. And the shortest answer is it's to enable the public to understand before anything is constructed what the effect will be, vi what the visual effect will be, how tall it will be, um, how far away it will be visible, uh, and the approximate size. It will how, be. How is, and how is that accomplished? Uh, just. Oh, I'm sorry. it's done by raising a, a balloon. Uh, it's a. It's usually a. Uh, so it really is a balloon. Yeah, it is a oh, balloon. Okay. It's a. It's a dirigible shaped thing with uh, <clears throat> ailerons on it, so that uh, it remains stable while it's flying up to certain wind speeds, anyway, uh, and enables the public uh, to understand, you know, what what's being proposed, so they're not surprised. And it's it's advertised. Uh, as you know, I believe it's 14 days in advance. Uh, there's also a sign required to be placed where it's going to be so that those who don't perhaps read the public notices uh, will still know and understand what's being proposed. Are we requiring the, the box to be on the pole now? I, I, Ryan showed the, the example where the, where the pole and the box were separate. They, that... they can be put either on the pole, in the pole, or underground. There are as with most things, there are advantages and disadvantages to, to each. Um, but my, my understanding is that the city's preference at this point is to minimize the visual intrusiveness and put them underground if possible uh, in, in a vault. Now, the vault has to be climate controlled because of the electronic equipment that's in it. Um, but it can be done. It, it's done regularly throughout the country. Any other questions? I was gonna, so a vault has to be climate controlled, but if they put it on the pole, doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be. That's Correct. Good. And I guess I've got a question for Ryan. I guess. Um, thank you. Okay. Can you describe our relationship with this contractor? Are we, this is obviously an exclusive, are we married? Or are we just going to, I mean, what are our options in the future? Our game plan is it would be for a one year period of time. And then at the end of that one year period of time, if we have others that are interested in saying, hey, I want to provide those services, then we can put it out there to bid. But we have, we've checked with other towns and cities and, and other county attorneys and city attorneys, and, and we're following the same processes because it's a specialty type application. But if there are others, just like we did with the TIA, where we had the same two engineers for TIAs for a long time, and we had other engineers that say, hey, I'm interested in doing those or providing those services. So we opened it back up for a bid, and we would do the same thing. This would be for a year trial, and then we could extend or create a new contract or we could put it out and have others bid on it. But the action before you does not hire a consultant. Right. Uh, you know, these but, I mean, obviously we have a relationship establishing, so I was just yes. was curious about that. But again, uh, those are contractual matters that we have not entered into because obviously you've not authorized this approach to regulating them. I guess, Ryan, could you help me understand a little bit more? We, you know, I didn't get to read the entire of this text amendment, but I did notice that we've deleted nine pages and added 30. So that doesn't seem like that's really to the benefit of the applicant or anything. I mean, 
it was designed not to be to the benefit of the applicant. Okay. And, and being quite frank with you, what we find is that our current regulations uh, simply don't cover the matter because they're not technical enough. These regulations have, are designed to be very technical, and as you read them, uh, you will notice the, what I call the technicality of them. And it is specifically intended to make sure that in our reviews, we are complying with the federal law of the FCC, and that we're also following the best practices on the type of poles, the type of, of fixtures that are going on the poles, and so forth. This is indeed true regulation of the wireless industry. And we believe from a staff standpoint that it's necessary because if we don't regulate them to this degree, uh, they will decide where they're going to put them and how they're going to put them, and your city will, will suffer the consequences uh, from an aesthetic standpoint. And as far as I read somewhere about the... Uh the different heights or the varying heights, and it seemed almost ambiguous. I mean, is there an established visual optimum that you're looking for in heights? Or it, It's not set in stone. It's, it's designed for the applicant to show that there's a technical need to go to 100 or 120 or 150. If they don't have the need because they can accomplish the same, basically, service at 100, but they want to put 150, why have an additional 50-foot tall tower just because they'd like to put a 150-foot tall tower there when the service could be provided at 100? But in a residential neighborhood, it is limited to 35 feet. And one of the reasons is because in the residential neighborhoods, you can only build a home to a height of 35 feet. So we don't want, for example, a 75-foot or 100-foot tall pole uh, to be put in front of someone's home. My last question is, um, can I rent my chimney to one of these providers, or is that not going to work? That's actually a good question. Well, um, both Verizon buildings here in town have, I believe there are four, three or four antennas on each of the, the buildings. Their old building, which is now a mattress uh, company in front of Best Buy and Staples, there's three or four antennas on top of the roof. And it's also, on their new building, if you look, it almost looks like a lampshade. They've got four antennas on top of that building, I believe. But what's the three answer? Yeah, I think sure, the you could. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. They just would have to negotiate a lease with you, which is why they want to put it in the right of way instead. But they I could put it. You mean that's right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank Thank you. Let's go ahead and recess the regular council meeting. It's time and see if we have any public input here. We'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this matter? If so please indicate by raising your hand. <clears throat> Seeing no one. Close the public hearing, reconvene the regular council meeting. Council, you're being asked to uh, approve the text amendment. about this, this subject to, to be too intelligent about it, but I'll make a motion. I make a motion that we approve the uh, UDO text amendment uh, found in attachment A, and that the text amendment advances the public interest. Do we have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further comment? All in favor? Aye. Say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. And that brings us to agenda item number eight, and this is dealing with uh, the fee schedule uh, amendment for development fees for uh, wireless telecommunication applications. And Ryan's going to present this item. Ryan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight we have a fee schedule amendment that's needed so that if we were to enter into an agreement with a provider to review or provide expert assistance, um, that we can collect that fee by the developer to have that expert assistance provided. Uh, those changes are identified in attachment A, and they follow the standards that we have seen across the state. In fact, in, in a lot of cases, ours are lower than some that I've seen. And there are others, such as the eligible facilities request, that are actually capped 
for North Carolina general statute. So even if they wanted to charge more than the thousand dollars for an eligible facility, they're unable to do so. It's capped by the general statutes. So we, we need that change to seek expert assistance. Let me just say a couple of things. From the beginning, when we began working with this group, we've told them this is a non-exclusive arrangement. We've always viewed this as being just like your TIA uh, documents are. There is uh, a request for uh, qualifications, et cetera, that comes in, and if they meet those, and there's a, a rotation, a list. Having said that, we've been informed, at least by Orange County, that these folks have been the only folks that have ever come knocked on their door for the last three to five years since they've been in service in there. There's not a lot of other folks out there that are in this business, apparently, at least based upon Orange County, uh, is experience. So, again, uh, we will be uh, working to have them as a provider to, pro to provide this service. But, again, this is not exclusive. Uh, we, we have, you know, we're not saying that if someone else comes and knocks and can meet qualifications that they can provide the same service that they would not be allowed to participate also. But, again, what I've said, Orange County at least tells us that there's not a lot of other folks out there. Additionally, and Mr. Lazaro will, will know this, that there's been legislation that has been uh, proposed, at least on the state level, that would restrict our ability to do what you just voted to do in a tremendous way. Now, that's pending in the long session, and that's been some of the uh, information that the League has sent out to you. I think it was even uh, on the thing that came out Friday from Rose Vaughn Williams. So if you want to go back and look at that, you can look at it. <clears throat> but, uh, again, the League is, is working with it. Everybody's working to formulate a position to try to have that not to happen, at least in the... Uh, the way that it's been presented at this point in time. But again, <clears throat> thank you. Any other questions around? So at, as we gain experience of this process, would there be a, could there conceivably be a point in time that say, well, we, we kind of understand this, say this one application, that we would bring it in-house, or is I'd, it always going to be beyond <clears throat> our scope? I think it will always be beyond our scope, just like it's beyond our scope to do a TIA. Uh -huh. It's the same kind of analysis. Uh, you know, there's components to it, widgets, et cetera, uh, uh, waves, uh, right. and so forth, that, you know, I don't understand. Uh, and, again, you've got to understand that to be able to engage with these providers, which we want them to provide. Like I said, it's a balancing thing. We want to be able to get the data and the, the more opportunities for streaming movies on your cell phone, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the, uh, the GIS stuff on your cell phones. We want to be able to get that, but there's got to be a balancing between the aesthetics and receiving that product. That's right. And we want to be able to retain the right to make that decision, which is being on a local level, yeah. on a local <laughs> level, which this may all be a mute point in the future, providing legislation uh, passes in the, in the long session, because that's been an effort to take that right away from local government. But we're hoping to keep that right to make those decisions at a local level. So, and that's the decision you have today. Mr. Ward. Are these fees, uh, for example, negotiation 7,500, 7, are they defined in, in the UDO as to what constitutes negotiations and, and so forth? I don't define in the agreement lease negotiations. Yes, so the agreement aspect, uh, I don't know that, that they are defined, but the negotiation aspect from our standpoint would be the four franchise agreements that the city has entered into. Staff dealt with that franchise agreement. Moving forward, we would let you know, an expert handle those negotiations and advise us on what we could or could not do in association with that franchise agreement. The, the term negotiations I thought was ambiguous, and I, I wasn't sure if it was well defined and, and spelled out as to what was what was actually being talked about. So, what we could do, and, and again, uh, the nice thing is you have adopted the regulation. Uh, I don't know that it hurts for us to make sure that we have entitled this oh, yeah. correctly. Yeah. I have no problem with you continuing this to the next workshop or next meeting, which would be the fourth of April where we could just verify that we're using the correct term. You know, the, the important thing, while the fee is certainly important, the important action was amending the UDO. 
So if you feel more comfortable with us taking two more weeks to look at the title, I'm not opposed to that at all. I, the comfort level, y'all have to give us a comfort level, and I'm not hearing it tonight. So I'm just, All right, then what I'm, I'm going to ask is that you simply continue this to your April 4th meeting, and we'll report to you and make sure that we've identified the title of the fee correctly. And, and that you understand what's what's involved in them. I mean, I, that's, that's understood, of course. Just, yes, sir. Can, is it possible that we just don't include the negotiation? I mean, the other items are defined. An eligible facility is defined in state statute. I mean, an eligible facility is where I have an existing pole and I'm going to add an antenna. That's defined. I would ask, if possible, that we go ahead and consider voting on everything if we have concerns with what all the negotiation would be covered. Just basically strike that tonight and we'll bring it back forward. And I would concur with Ryan in the sense that we now have an ordinance on the books that says you've got to, we got to get an expert in. We can't get an expert in. You've got somebody paying for it, and we certainly as a city don't want to pay for it. We want the, uh, the Sprints and the Verizons, et cetera, of the world to pay that. So, again, we could strike the negotiation and the, move forward with the other ones to at least have something in place as far as a fee schedule. There's not a motion on no, no, no. We're just I, would, I really don't see the need to delay it. I, I, I would make a motion to move forward with it as presented. I mean, I, even, even if you don't know what a fee is yeah. and what is what is being asked or what is covered, what they're going to get for their fee. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I don't. I don't. But we do have it in the scope of work. Yeah, so a negotiation would be a new yeah. water tower lease, even though they may not, or the next company may not. Because right now, engineering handles our water tower leases, and we're not saying that's going to change. But we have the ability, if we want to turn it over to the expert, to negotiate a lease on behalf of the city. That would be one negotiation. Another negotiation would be a franchise agreement. Because we have an exclusive franchise agreement for, I think, seven years with four of these individuals. If there is a fifth person that comes along that wants a franchise agreement, that would be a negotiation. We can strike negotiation and move forward. But, but again, I think what Ryan think said. the attorney if, needs to direct us in that. If, yeah. your, if your motion was, Mr. Lazara, to. To, uh, to move to, forward to, with other than the, the naming of. To, to strike the, the negotiations, strike, yes. whatever the amount was, so you, move forward with the yes. other, uh, is yeah. what I heard the motion to be. be directed. Yes. Was there a second? <coughs> okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, who, who was that? Aye. Uh, Raise uh, your hands. We have to go through our hands. Okay. All opposed? Okay. <clears throat> so basically, we're just going to figure out the name of it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Did that land where it was supposed to? Yeah. Okay. We basically approved everything but the negotiation, but the which negotiation was stricken. Was stricken. It was stricken. The others are so defined. That they by can the develop statute. the proper name for it as requested. UDA. Correct. That's correct. Right. Correct. Okay. We're good. All right. Brings us to our comment section here for tonight. I'm going to start down at this end of the table with Mr. Bittner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you're aware, that Mr. Ozara, Mayor Pro Tem Ozara, and I are. Your representatives on Onwasa, there's been some developments with Onwasa that involve the city that I think I need to report to you uh, without getting into a lengthy discussion. Let me just say that the city at one time handled the leachate from the Onwasa County landfill. Uh, for those who don't know, leachate is really rainwater that falls on the landfill and sifts through the garbage and is collected and disposed of before the city put in its land application system that leachate was collected and taken off site to a treatment facility. When the city built its land application facility, uh, we offered on Silicondi the, the ability to have that leachate treated by the city at its land application facility. That procedure and agreement worked fine for years until Onwasa decided to construct a new treatment plant outside of Richlands and build new sewer lines to serve the industrial park. And when they did this, Onwasa 
also took over the responsibility because of the configuration of lines to treat that leachate. Well, what has happened is the their new plant on Wassa's plant, state-of-the-art facility as it is, was not capable of handling the leachate in terms of treating it to an acceptable discharge, causing on Wassa to get a notice of violation from the state. Uh, the city has stepped forward again with on Wassa to try to help them out of this problem by agreeing that we would again allow the leachate to be pumped to the land application facility. Of course, there'll be, there'll be an expense to Onwasa for treating that leachate. So I just wanted to keep you abreast of this of this development. Michael, is there anything you want to add? I just I'd like to thank Richard and his team for the work and of the course. effort that they've put in in making that happen. Thank you very much. It's been very appreciated by uh, by all at Onwasa. So thank you. So is that for an indefinite amount of time now, or what? Yes. Yes, sir. Actually, the city the attorney and I are currently working on two interlocal agreements. One will be between. Uh, will, let me do that again. Start One off. will be between the city of Jacksonville and Onslow County relative to the leachate. The second will be between the city of Jacksonville and Onwasa relative to the temporary treatment of some residential effluent that is currently on the same line. Those should be in front of you for adoption in April, consideration and adoption in April. That's all I have. Mayor Pro Tem Lazar. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to uh, quickly congratulate uh, Northside uh, High School basketball team for winning the state championship. Uh, just give them a round of applause. And, if, uh, and I would recommend that if we can extend an invite maybe to a future meeting to recognize them, I think that would, that would be uh, a nice gesture yeah, on absolutely. our part. Uh, I think the record shows that uh, the last time this happened was in 1951 by Lejeune High School. Lejeune. High school as the proper uh, term, and that's all I have. Mayor George Barrows is watching. I know over he's you. watching over me. <laughs> Ms. Washington, I would just like to say thank you to my city council members, Mayor. I didn't mean to put two seconds. So the Mayor of Jacksonville City Council to Dr. Woodruff and Mr. Massey and Mr. Carter. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, so very much to the public for acknowledging my award from the National League of Cities proudly representing the city of Jacksonville, North Carolina. So, thank you. No report. Mr. Warden. Glad to be here, Mayor. Glad to have you. <laughs> With that said, uh, I don't have anything. I guess we go to Dr. Woodruff for your report. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor and members of council, uh, two things. First of all, we'd like to let the public know that on April the 4th, we will begin our budget delibera deliberations and workshop setting that will begin at 5 p.m. Also, at the joint meeting between the City Council and the County Commission several weeks ago, there was a mental health task force that was appointed. I believe, Mayor, that you appointed Mr. Lozera and Mr. Thomas to serve on that. The first meeting with the two of them and their counterparts from the county. I believe their counterparts are... Mr. Commissioner Knapp and Mark Price. Mark Price. Price and Commissioner Knapp. <laughs> Uh, we will have the organizational meeting of that task force on Monday, April the 3rd at 530 at the county. I'd also like to mention that yesterday at a workshop, the county commission did vote unanimously to move forward with a new joint land use study, commonly referred to as JLUSE, joint land use study. Over the next several weeks, the county staff will be uh, working on a formal application so that they will be the sponsor of this study. And I certainly commend the County Commission for taking that step. Lastly, as always, Mayor, Council, we appreciate the leadership. This community has benefited from what you give them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Mr. Carter? No report, Mayor. Okay. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye.